Hey everyone, good evening and welcome to the National Humanities Center uh, Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled The Great Migration, Different Perspectives. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Marcia Chatlin. Uh, she's a professor of history and African-American studies at Georgetown University. Today is October the 14th. Uh, again, everybody, my name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. I wanna thank you for joining us on behalf of my staff, Jira, Mike, and Meredith as well as uh, the rest of our colleagues at the center and this year's current fellowship class. In particular, as I look around the room tonight, I wanna welcome a, a couple of you individually. It's always great to, uh, to have Lorna with us. Lorna's from the Illinois State Museum. Lorna, I hope that if there are uh, resources or uh, materials that you have available at the museum, that you'll drop them in the chat box and share them with us. Um, Carl, I wanna thank for uh, rejoining us. Carl and Bonnie both are previous members of our Teacher Advisory Council. Uh, Carl is just west of Philadelphia at Radnor High School. Bonnie's in Palo Alto. Herbert, it's great to see you again. You're from Memphis. Kiri's joining us from the University of Arizona and Lydia from Wilbur Charter. Thanks all of you for joining us after what I know is uh, another long day uh, uh, teaching. Um, I do know that um, when I'm walking around the center, um, our fellows are in their studies, they're doing their research and their work. I know that oftentimes I hear music, I hear uh, music coming from either that tinny sound of their earbuds or perhaps I hear it underneath their door. Every now and again, we have to talk to one of our fellows about turning the volume down because a, a fellow in an adjacent office somewhere is, is, is perhaps working on different kinds of work. And I say that because, uh, as, as all of you, I, I suspect, uh, know to be true, that music can be very inspirational. It can also be very um, pedagogically sound to use. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the opening playlist tonight. Ida Cox and her all-star band, Bessie Smith, Fats Waller, Lead Belly. And I suspect that in tonight's session, we'll talk uh, more about finding interdisciplinary uh, entry points into tonight's topic and ways that you can use it in your teaching. Please do know that uh, scholars and, and experts and you know, folks who are studying this in terms of research are also looking at both the, the, the ways to be motivated themselves, but also ways that these um, these arts and, and other kinds of humanistic perspectives can shed light on the, the big fabric of the topics that we're studying. Of course, all the work that uh, we're sharing tonight is available for free in our online digital library, the Humanities Class Digital Library. Th these resources are free and open, and <clears throat> you can find them in, um, in the library by going to the webinar series group, and in those folders you'll find readings for tonight's session that professor has pulled together. You'll also find uh, some instructional materials that Tisha Hooks tonight's uh, TA has pulled together for us. One of the nice things about the digital library is that not only can you, um, can you trust and you can find the materials there that are free and open, but you know that you can use them with a Creative Commons license of non-commercial. We don't want anybody to come in and grab the good stuff and sell them somewhere, but you do know that you can share them with your students, you can uh, copy them, you can make them available. And that includes materials from all of our other uh, partners as well. And, and I'm always pleased to uh, bring forth and introduce you to some of those partners. Uh, these are organizations across the humanities who have made their materials available in the digital library. And I'm very pleased to be joined tonight by Mary Suter, who is here to share a little bit about her work uh, and the work of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Hey, Mary, can you hear me over in Missouri? Yes, I can, Andy, and thank you so much for allowing me to have a little time this evening. Um, I appreciate uh, everyone being on uh, here. I know that it was a long day, and um, so I'm Mary Suter, as Andy said. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and I'm responsible for um, providing economic and financial education outreach to K through college level educators. Um, and one of the things we do is develop classroom resources. And I wanted to share with you this evening a set of materials that we will have available on our website. Um, and they won't be available until uh, early 2022. Uh, we're currently in the process of securing rights for various primary source documents and other pieces, but they are um, uh, they are three lessons uh, on the Great Migration and the economics of the Great Migration. And so the first lesson is uh, focused on uh, Jacob Lawrence art and the uh, Great Migration series. And in that lesson, students will look at paintings from the series, and they'll be asked to match economics 
concepts and graphs to the paintings uh, to help them understand how different disciplines view an event in history. And um, it, it doesn't require that they have previous exposure to supply and demand, although that might be helpful. Um, part of the value for, for the lesson comes from matching the different modes of communication, the paintings, the visual mode, with the captions, the words, and the economic concepts and graphs. And even if the students may be unfamiliar with the paintings or the economics concepts, it appears to be uh, in the pilot testing a, a rich uh, lesson, a rich resource for students. And I should say these are we are targeting 10th through 12th grade for these at the high school level. Um, the second lesson in the series is about Harlem's journey and the rise and fall of Harlem. Uh, from the promise of the Renaissance in the 1920s, and then through the devastating neglect of post-World War II that really extracted the life out of the community. And this lesson incorporates primary source images, the music of Billie Holiday, and the poetry of Langston Hughes. The last lesson in this set of materials is called The Origins of Wealth Inequality, and it focuses on the economic collapse in the 1930s and the uh, resulting intervention of the U.S. government developing new policies to put Americans back on their feet again. And many of these programs centered on the growth of the housing stock and providing the tools for households to begin generating wealth. But we know that racism rife in our institutions didn't allow African Americans to have an equal opportunity at these policies. Um, and those impediments began an ever widening wealth gap that impacted generations far removed from the original policies. So the lesson incorporates primary source documents and images, um, as well as readings uh, and a redlining mapping tool available from the Richmond Fed. And we've been piloting these lessons and we have them being reviewed by uh, teachers as well. Um, and we're using those that information to help us refine and finish these lessons. And as I said, we hope to have the package available on our website, stlouisfed.org slash education. And as Andy pointed out, everything on our website is free for teachers to use. Um, and so these will be as well. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to let you know about these. Uh, I think they will, will be a, another tool, a powerful tool for um, talking about this topic. So Andy, thank you so much. And thank you, Mary, and I want to thank the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis for your partnership and your collaboration. One of the earliest uh, organizations, actually, that signed on to the Humanities and Class Digital Library. Um, and I also, as a very nice segue, want to note that uh, for those of you in the audience who are interested in these issues of race and identity and social justice, that our January 25th webinar with Sandy Darity at Duke University will focus on uh, uh, income disparity and wealth inequality. Um, and I would encourage all of you to consider uh, all four of these webinars as well as others in our series. I know uh, Annie Evans is with us tonight from New American History and she and her colleague Ed Ayers will be uh, joining us on December 9th for another look at the migration of the American South from a, a more geographic perspective. Um, many of you uh, attend a lot of our webinars and each time you earn five professional development hours it may be that sometimes our Tuesday or Thursday nights are not um, not convenient or you miss it for some reason or you know, you're just getting out of school and things turn a little crazy. If you're looking for a way to earn 35 professional development credit hours, I do encourage you to take a look at our online course catalog. These courses cover a wide variety of topics, including this one, Women of the Americas, Early Encounters and Entangled Histories. Uh, this course was developed in partnership with the New York Historical Society. And it would be a way to not only learn more about and immerse yourself in the topics, but also earn the kind of professional development credit that uh, is important uh, for each of you. I want to thank all of our Teacher Advisory Council for their continued work. That's past and present. I'm looking at you, Jenny, uh, down in Marietta. Um, your contributions, your continued involvement, and the ways that you contribute to our work is very important, and I want to thank you for that time. As you know, tonight's session is a audio and PowerPoint only uh, webinar, but your participation is still very important and that comes in the audience chat box. Many of you are using it already to share thoughts and ideas and uh, um, make uh, jokes as Ulysses is always here to do, but it's also a place to submit formal questions. If you do have a question for tonight's session, uh, please do drop it in the Ask the Professor tab and um, I'll, as the moderator, I'll bring that forward. 
Um, Mary, do you mind muting yourself right there in the presenter bridge? Thank you. Um, as the moderator, I'll bring those forward and I will bring the questions to uh, Professor Chatlin when the time seems appropriate. So again, you've joined uh, the Great Migration, Different Perspectives. Uh, Marcia Chatlin is our lead scholar and guest tonight. She's a professor of history and African-American studies at Georgetown University. I'm really pleased too to, to welcome back Tisha Hooks, who is a, a teacher at the Hopkins School in New Haven, Connecticut. Tisha is here as our TA. She's gonna be dropping thoughts and links in the chat box. She's also curated some instructional resources that you might find helpful for the teaching of this topic. So we're about to begin. Professor Chatlin, how are you up in DC? I'm good. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us. Um, I know that uh, we've talked a couple of times tonight. We've alluded about the, the pressures of teaching right now. And I don't just mean in the pandemic. I mean in the uh, environment in which um, both K-12 and higher ed classrooms are uh, being evaluated, whether you mean for them to or not, where students are um, are coming in with certain preconceptions and assumptions. And before we begin tonight, I wonder if, if you can comment. You know, you've, you've taught for a while now. You've been in classrooms for a long while. How, how have things changed for you as you approach your teaching and your classes, your students? How have things changed now from where they were even 10 or 15 years ago? Well, that's a, I think that's a great place to start because um, we find ourselves in a an unfortunate cultural moment in which the backlash against um, teaching American history to its fullest um, has become well organized and well funded. I think that for me as a specialist in 20th century African American history, the content can stay pretty consistent, but what students understand and what they glean from the context in which they're learning is always something fascinating to me. When I teach my history of the civil rights class uh, prior to 2014, I would start with a slide that says, you know, is protest dead? And, you know, students would have a pretty engaging conversation uh, whether direct action, you know, nonviolent protest was still a viable strategy and whether it was still visible in our current context. Well, after the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, after the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, I just stopped asking that question because it felt a little ridiculous because students had um, found themselves immersed in a, a moment in which, you know, direct action on the ground protest was an everyday part of their lives, either as participants or observers. So I think that, you know, one of the things that we try to do um, in our college history teaching that we try to do frame and provide a resource for our K through 12 teachers is to help students understand that history is an engagement with framing and filters and that no one frame or one filter is the only one or the correct one, but that using these different parameters on how we view history may yield different stories and that it is our um, privilege and responsibility to try to extract as many stories from one historical moment as possible. Wait a minute, Professor. I'm sorry, but you just had one of those uh, kind of Shazam bumper sticker moments. Uh, everybody quickly started to jot this down. I think you just said that history and teaching history, understanding history is about framing and filters. Yes. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful. Can I? Oh, there's the audience chat. Oh, hey, audience. <laughs> I said, where's everyone there. writing this down? I yeah. love, there's so many Los Angeles Unified School District. Yeah, there are. Folks A lot of folks in LA. LA. That's right. I'm glad you discovered that. I'm sorry that you you didn't realize you were speaking to a room full of people. Um, you thought Where's it was just you. all talking. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. But but that's a really that's a critical thing. And so I guess as a follow up question, and we need to move on. So I don't mean to take us sideways, but that concept of framing and filters, from your perspective as an historian, as a university educator, is that something that we apply individually? That we we all have our hands on the levers and the frames and the filters, or and or does it come from outside of us where whereby the curriculum or the choices teachers make or the conversations we have who actually controls those frames and filters you mentioned well i think that this is an excellent point you know when we think about the stories that are told over and over again it usually indicates which groups of people which um which filters and which frames are allowed to dominate and i think that one of the best ways that we can teach history um, to our students who are immersed in a context 
in which they're creating an archive all the time. And this is something I say to my students. If I were to write a biography of you and I only had your Instagram account, what stories would I tell about you? And what if I was able to see your Facebook account? And what if I was able to see your text messages? And what if I was able to see your TikTok? What do each of these um, different formats allow us to know about you? And what are the things that we'll never be able to access about you from the archive? And I use that exercise to try to help them understand that when historians are creating history, they may have an agenda, they may have a limited um, set of references that they're using, but regardless of what the limitation is, that we have to understand these stories as both informative and also um, igniting enough a sense of curiosity and uh, skepticism and criticism and that all of these things and an appreciation for the stories that are being told. I think the more that, that we can show our students those layers of nuance and those layers of understanding, the more and more we get them excited about the study of history and I think more and more reflective about their own role in making history in their own lives. It's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And of course, many of the students that you teach uh, may well have been sitting in classrooms from our audience uh, the year or the two years prior. So it's a really nice uh, framing uh, to, to set uh, for tonight. Um, let's go ahead and get started again as the moderator. I'll be bringing questions to you on occasion, but you can control the slides and we're anxious to hear your perspective. Thank you. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here. Um, one of the things that I've been very fortunate um, to have experienced in my career over the past decade or so is a lot of engagement with K-12 teachers, um, talking to teachers through groups sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities or PBS um, uh, student reporting labs or whichever organizations or by invitation from individual teachers. And I think that it's our responsibility as uh, college um, educators to really support and help and encourage our K through 12 educators as much as we can, um, not only in providing content, uh, providing different avenues uh, for methodology, but also encouraging all of you as you do the difficult work of teaching students about the past and helping them better understand the present that um, we all are experiencing. So um, I'm so excited uh, to be here and uh, Tisha Hooks from New Haven, Connecticut, uh, thank you for being my TA tonight. Hopefully, um, maybe in the after times we'll have an opportunity to meet in real life. Okay, let's see. Yes, I know how to use the um, slides. So today I'd like to talk uh, to you about different ways that um, I have taught the um, African-American Great Migration, uh, different ways for us to organize the content, to make it meaningful to our students, and some different resources that I found really effective um, across all grade levels. Um, just a little background on my interest. I'm the author of two books. The first is Southside Girls, Growing Up in the Great Migration. In many ways was my tribute to my hometown of Chicago. And it was also the um, fulfillment of my curiosity about rethinking the Great Migration experience. As a Chicagoan, um, I'm very aware that there's so many books about the Great Migration as it relates to the city, because in many ways, Chicago served as the launch pad for the experimentation in um, migration, and I think that um, Chicago also represents the complexity of the Great Migration story in terms of both the triumphs and poignancy the experience by migrants. So uh, this book uh, centered the experiences of girls and African American um, African American girls and teenagers and their experience of the migration in order to open up the possibility of understanding the Great Migration as animated by family's desire to protect and invest in girls. We'll talk about some of the narratives about why people left the South, um, but I think very few people imagine a way of understanding African-American community investment 
in girls being able to have a childhood, having access to the opportunities of the urban north as part of the reason why families left. And so by centering African-American girls and young women, I had an opportunity to explore some of the contours of the Great Migration that wasn't in other uh, pieces of literature. And so what was most exciting about this book, it was an opportunity to contribute to a larger conversation about the history of childhood and particularly the history of girlhood, which has expanded with excellent books about girls in New Orleans, Washington, D.C., um, as well as um, throughout the South, um, but what it also did was it helped us remember that there's still so many stories that have yet to be told. And the use of archives in this book is something I'm particularly proud of. And the material in this book has been adapted uh, for audiences in that K through 12 space that may not read an academic monograph, but can really glean a lot of interesting stories from the content of Southside Girls. All right. so. When I take a thematic approach um, to teaching about the Great Migration, I usually try to introduce students to kind of four dominant themes. I usually find four works really well because depending on um, a student's interest, they can kind of zero in on very specific themes as they relate to the content. So the first one is population. One of the opening questions that I like to frame the study of the Great Migration is to ask the question, how did Southern migration change the demographics of American cities? Depending on where you're teaching, um, particularly if you're teaching outside of the U.S. South, there is a sense that um, the, the African American community is a community that's inherently urban, or you might see in a news story or in kind of political discourse, that um, urban has become a synonym for black. And so I want students to think about what happens when populations shift and change. And this semester, as I'm teaching a class on the Great Migration, we've really tried to think about um, narratives of migration in other contexts. Uh, at the beginning of the school year, we saw those gripping um, uh, images of um, people trying to flee Afghanistan. We have seen the pictures uh, from the southern border of people trying to um, uh, emigrate from economic and political hostilities to search for a different land. And so as you introduce students to this idea of an internal migration in the United States, I think that this becomes a really great opening to think about the coverage as well as the stories that come out of um, people who are seeking refugee status in the United States and doing some comparing and contrasting in the ways that migrants during the Great Migration were also reported on in their day. The other big um, kind of framing device that I sometimes use for students is politics. How did black migration change party politics? And so thinking about the political um, um, thinking about the political life of African Americans, um, I, I, depending on the age of the students you teach, I don't know if President Barack Obama resonates with them um, in the same ways that my slightly older students um, it works. But to think about, you know, the election of an African American president who um, planted his adult roots in Chicago. Um, coming from a part of the city that's very much associated with the Great Migration, sometimes we work backwards, right? So we talk about um, Michelle Obama's presentation to the country as a South Side girl, and we think about what that means. Um, we think about um, what does it mean for African Americans to have um, political strength in American cities? Like, what does that say? about the changing nature of politics in the 20th century. And it provides an opportunity for students to really think about the rendering of electoral maps that we see today. So when you're, if you're teaching this during um, an election cycle, you can talk about maps being blue and red and what they mean and how African-American migration shapes the politics. Um, the other thing that we talk about is placemaking, and I loved that the introductory remarks about the resources available um, from St. Louis 
includes a redlining map. Um, we talk about how did migration create the segregation we um, we see today, and we talk about you know the ways that students observe how um, race often defines where people live and how they live, and how the Great Migration contributes to it. So I really love um, you know being able to connect the dots and bringing the Great Migration into the place of significance that I think it really has for our contemporary culture that in many ways is, is hiding in plain sight. I think that if students were asked to talk about the kind of five most significant moments in American history, they would probably say the Civil War, perhaps the two world wars. Um, they might talk about you know, the rise of technology. Um, and I think the Great Migration should fit within that to help them understand how we got to where we are today. And then the last thing, and I'm so glad we started with a playlist and some music, is we talk about popular culture. We talk about the music, art, and literature that's shaped by not only the migration experience, but the settling of migrants into cities like Detroit and the birth of um, R&B, the birth of um, Motown, the birth of um, what would become rap music, which will later give birth to hip hop. So we talk about how, again, this movement of black culture and aesthetics inspires a lot of the things that we see today that are identifiable parts of black culture, but students might not know the origin stories. And so using those four themes, again, population, politics, placemaking, and popular culture, um, I try to help students also understand um, in a very important part of the Great Migration. And I think this could be really helpful uh, for folks who are teaching outside of um, you know, the Midwest or some parts of the Northeast in which you know, students might have a little bit more exposure to the Great Migration roots of that city. Um, but I think for folks in the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast, there is an incredible story that has yet to be fully articulated about westward migration as part of the Great Migration. Um, the folks who took the train from Louisiana to Los Angeles and created um, Creole clubs in Southern California. Uh, the people who went further north to Oakland and San Francisco and the families that went to Seattle and Portland to try to work in the defense industry during World War II, um, African-American westward migration into Denver, and the ways that um, these migratory patterns that were tied to individual states and the train routes allow for a kind of contour to African-American culture, which is also um, an issue that students may not have had an opportunity to really think about. While they are probably able to identify what are markers of black culture, black regional culture does present a wonderful opportunity for some exploration. One resource that I'm gonna talk about um, in a little bit is the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, I, most of you are in person again for schools, but I don't know how many schools are doing um, annual trips to Washington DC right now, but you can bring Washington DC to your students and one, I think, of the great ways you can illustrate this is to look over the menu of the cafeteria at the National Museum of African American History and Culture because it's devoted to black Southern cuisine, black Western cuisine, and black Northeastern cuisine. And it shows all of these different influences. And with this kind of small um, you know, presentation of a menu, you can open up a lot of conversations about these routes of migration. Um, one activity that I saw um, a group do of predominantly African American girls in Chicago is to trace the train routes of their own family trees and their own family narratives uh, for students who have roots in the U.S. And it's a really powerful um, explanation for some students how their grandparents or great grandparents were friends in Mississippi, they were friends in Alabama, and they remain friends in Chicago. Um, uh, professor, so may I ask a quick question? Uh -huh. uh, just a ahead. really quick question. So I, I love that idea of of tracing the family and asking students to consider that that sort of migratory patterns of their families. And as you suggested, it's kind of starts from the beginning and moves to where they went. Mm 
Have you ever seen or do you recommend, uh, particularly for our many West Coast participants tonight, actually doing it in reverse and trying to figure out where they came from? And if so, what kinds of entry points might they find uh, to, to that journey? Um, for folks in the West? Exactly. So if they were doing it backwards, yeah. trying to figure out where, where their families came from versus where they went, how, how might that work? Well, you know, it's interesting. They would probably um, see a lot of uh, a lot of Texas and Louisiana. And one of the things that you can do is using um, an online archive of the kind of old um, railways. You can see the cities that people stopped in. Um, another project that might be interesting if you work backwards um, and um, if folks settled in the West Coast, they're, if they have some generational roots, they're mo most likely coming from that um, southern Arkansas, Louisiana corner through Texas. The other thing you can do is use the um, Green Book, the, motorist, uh, the Negro Motorist Guide, and yes. you can see like the places that they may have stopped on their journeys. Um, out of the south into the north. And if you really want to have a good time, you can actually have the students use Google Maps to put yeah. in those addresses and to see what is now there. And you can really help them, like you said, um, do this kind of back and forth exploration sure. of their roots. Yeah, that's really fantastic. And I, I'm always uh, struck, uh, as someone who grew up in the American South, I'm always struck when I go out west. And for example, I'll find a barbecue shack. And I just think to myself, this started back this started back in the other part of the country, mm -hmm. I think, or at least I have that sensation that whether it was literal or not, and uh, the way that foodways can also um, really show those footprints seems to be interesting. Well, you know the other thing about it that's also interesting is um, and this is a deeper dive, but there's some great um, you know documentaries that talk about the clubs that emerge in these cities to help people hold on to their uh, cultures of origin. And um, the Los Angeles Creole Clubs, the Los Angeles New Orleans Clubs, um, like the Chicago Mississippi Clubs, um, for many uh, years, and it's very recently that some of these clubs have died out because their members are now approaching their 80s and 90s, they would do pilgrimages back to the South. Um, there's a great documentary called, I think, Sweet Home Chicago that shows a group of African-American um, uh, senior citizens getting on the bus and going back to Mississippi. Yeah. So these are yeah. all great opportunities. Fantastic. So, I appreciate you for the, for the answer. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've been doing this semester, and this is the first time I've been doing it, um, I'm also glad that the migration series was mentioned. So oh, there's so many good ideas. Is that I try to punctuate class with um, a few of the um, paintings that are part of the 60 part Jacob Lawrence um, series on the Great Migration, um, each of them numbered and uh, captioned. And I use it to just kind of, you know, have the students reflect on what these images look like. And I sometimes have them, um, you know, look at all of the images and see what are the common themes. So, for instance, when, when Lawrence is uh, painting motion or movement, he uses certain colors. We talk about the difference um, in uh, kind of scale and shape when, um, oh, thank you, uh, someone said going to Chicago is the name of the film. Um, we talk about the difference in scale and shape when he's uh, painting about the South versus the North. Um, we're fortunate in Washington, D.C. to have half of the paintings here, and in New York City there's the other half, but again, this is a great opportunity for a virtual a uh, field trip where um, students can all go online and look at the paintings. I and mean, there's a real poignancy um, and simplicity to the ways that um, these images are labeled, you know. Um, and it's also about the storytelling of the Great Migration that's being kind of painted in that era. So we look at, uh, these are some of, um, I think, you know, some of the most affecting um, images and we talk about what stories um, these images can tell. Um, we talk about um, what Lawrence is trying to communicate to a broad audience. And so um, using these images has been really helpful. 
um, sometimes in just kind of punctuating class, because a lot of what we talk about, and again, this is something that is contingent on, you know, the context and the age of the students that you're teaching, but, you know, we talk about the racial violence that animated people's um, exit uh, from the South, and sometimes after a particularly, you know, series of difficult topics, using the art to students have, like, um, so students can get, like, a breath, take a pause, and understand that while the migration did expose a lot of people to northern racism, to economic disparities, and to a lot of challenges, the migration was not a moment without inspiration. And to show that this complicated moment can inspire something so beautiful, I think is an important message to reinforce to students that the learning of history can be tough, and it can also provide wonderful um, uh, ways to, um, uh, you know, excite and inspire our um, imagination. So I think it's something that, um, you know, that is important. Uh, someone asked, why aren't uh, all paintings together in the same place? I think they just have two different owners. Occasionally they're brought together in New York or D.C., so you can see all 60 together. I think I saw all 60 together maybe four or five years ago, and it was really just um, just spectacular, again, to be able to read all of the stories, uh, um, you know, at once. All right. So another approach um, that uh, I think is helpful in thinking about the great migration is to help students understand that history is sometimes written uh, as a series of narratives and that there can be narrative themes in historical writing as well as in um, literature. And so one of the ways that we do this in my class is we might read a little bit of um, literary history of the Great Migration. So some of the Great Migration writers that students might be familiar with from other classes are um, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. So I think they still teach it in AP English. Um, it's been a while. Um, you may have students be familiar with uh, Native Son by Richard Wright. And so thinking about the fictional um, content that they might be familiar with in another class or partnering with a colleague in an English class to say, we want to do a great migration section in both of these classes. How can we come together to help students kind of understand the really porous um, borders between the kind of writing that African American writers are doing at this time to try to capture the complexity of urban life and how does that contribute to our understanding of history? So the ways that um, the narrative elements are sometimes articulated um, in the story of the Great Migration is that um, the South stands as a place of complex experiences, that the um, South, oh, excuse me, the South is um, the origin, this is the place Let's of people's see. birth, uh, thank you, but it's also a place of racial violence and a lack of opportunity. Um, this cartoon that appears in the NAACP crisis um, shows, you know, the migrant fleeing to the North, um, uh, after seeing an image of a body that's being lynched. And this is the kind of image that, again, I would say, you know, you know your students and you know their maturity level about presenting. But the South is a place of these complex experiences that people have to decide how they're going to grapple with. Um, the other narrative element um, that you can introduce to students is that um, there's a confrontation with the urban North. And so how do people understand places that are deeply unfamiliar to them? Um, you know, uh, this is something that when, um, you know, I'm teaching at the college level, students can kind of relate to this idea of being often in a new setting than the one that they're used to. But this is also an opportunity to get students to reflect on the experiences of moving, the experience of immigration, the experience of, um, you know, starting in a new place, what are the ways that you confront the new challenges of that experience? Um, one of the narrative elements that you find in a lot of great migration literature that you can help students hone in on is how do people create safe spaces in their new context? 
whether it's establishing uh, those cultural and regional clubs, as I mentioned earlier, whether it is um, opening a church um, that has members of um, the congregation that were the same people that you knew in the South, whether it is enjoying the nightlife of a new city, whether it's forming friendships, whether it's getting involved in political activism, how do people in this new context create spaces where they, um, you know, where they really feel like they can belong? And then um, another narrative element that you can introduce to students is this idea of a vision for the future. Why does someone risk their, um, their sense of familiarity and their bonds for a place that they've never been to or have a hard time imagining? And I think that this is another place where you can help students kind of move out of the context in which they exist, one in which you can't preview some, an experience before you have it. And this is something that I often say about why I love teaching so much. Teaching is one of the few experiences I have that I can't preview. Um, before COVID, I used to travel a lot. And so every time I was going to on a trip, whether it was the hotel or a restaurant I wanted to try or reading Yelp reviews about you know X or Y, I always get a preview of an experience. But what makes teaching, I think, so fantastic is that we don't get a preview. We are just in the moment and we're present with the students in front of us. And so I think that to help students understand a context in a world in which people are migrating on a lot of faith, um, you know, uh, some stories they may have heard from a good friend or a relative or a few newspaper articles, and then they head out into this new place. Um, I'm going to um, let me get to these questions in a second. They're so good. So I'm going to say a few things yeah. and then I'll go to the questions. Yeah, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm going to queue them up in, in a moment when you pause, and I'll bring them to you. Excellent. Um, you know, the the question of like why why leaving, um, why is that so important? And so um, when you talk to students about push factors, um, again using your discretion and understanding the environment in which you teach in and um, the maturity of your students, you know, talking about lynching and racial violence is something that um, you know has a ha, ha, always is an element in explaining why people left the Great Migration um, or and participated in it, but I think in light of um, some recent events, the poignancy of what students understand as racialized violence, I think really can open up some very deep and thoughtful reflections. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of interesting for, um, for students today is that I think you can make an argument that Great Migration participants were in some ways um, migrants because of climate issues. Um, some of the reasons why people left is because they, um, because they no longer had work in the agricultural fields because of the boll weevil infestation of cotton, because of floods and, drought, and droughts. And I think that this is also a really interesting place to talk about um, you know, some of the concerns that have recently emerged in our public discourse about climate refugees and the way that climate change is making some places in, uninhabitable and forcing people to uh, go to new places in order to secure their livelihood. So I think that there's a way to talk about you know, climate. And if you are at a school that is taking an interdisciplinary approach to big themes, I think that this could be a really powerful um, opportunity to pair up with a science teacher and talk about some of the ways that climate change um, impacts people's human decisions. Uh, economic oppression, so you can introduce students to sharecropping and the economic um, instability that African Americans experience in the South. And then introducing agency, which is always, I think, such an important thing when we're teaching history. You know, how do people um, make decisions for themselves? How do they confront and overcome, um, you know, some type of political or social repression? Um, you know, sometimes they they use they use agency, and this is a very brave choice in making the decision to leave the South. And so I think that 
trying to think about these narrative themes of why people leave and what that exit must have been like um, is a wonderful opportunity to get students to think really deeply about uh, change and continuity over time and the ways that they can actually relate on some levels to people who were in um, this, uh, this period of history. All right, let me take a step back and answer yeah. some questions. Thank, thank you. And uh, again, as the moderator, I'm going to encourage all of our participants to use the Ask the Professor tab to submit formal questions, and um, I'll bring those forward. First question, and a couple of these might require just short answers, a couple of them perhaps a little longer. Uh, the first question comes from Carl. Again, Carl is from Radnor High School just outside of Philadelphia, and he wonders if the Jacob Lawrence photograph, or, I'm sorry, images, paintings, wherever artwork were ever displayed all together in one place. Do you know that? Occasion yeah, occasionally it happens in either Chicago or DC. Um, mm. I saw them a few years ago in DC together and it's really spectacular. Great, thank you. Um, this next question comes from Jamie. Jamie is at um, Three Rivers School District uh, just outside of Los Angeles. Uh, in Jamie's town, uh, she grew up in a town at least that, that was not as inclusive of people of color. And she's curious about this, this notion that the Great Migration included Los Angeles as a destination. She wonders, did people migrating have a list of cities that they should not go to in California or maybe that they should go to? Um, you know, the, that's a great question. Um, if you look at the archive of old African-American newspapers like the Chicago Defender um, in Los Angeles, it would have been the Los Angeles Sentinel. Um, there are stories of instances of racial violence, of things kind of erupting, especially in the summers after the end of World War I and some critical moments during World War II. What animated a lot of cities that people migrated to was the desire for laborers. And African-American laborers were um, in a better position to get industrial jobs in the North and the West after the isolation period after World War I and again, when the defense industries needed so many supplies during World War II. And so people would have known the places where the best jobs were. And job recruiters were using the black newspapers to get people to town. So there was a kind of a sense of where economically it was the best place to go. Um, but this could be an excellent project of reading about cities in which there were instances of racial violence and that probably uh, deterred people from going there. Mm, thank you. Um, this question comes from Andrew. Andrew's at the Ardley, Ardsley School in New York, and he's curious um, about the extent that African Americans benefited from their movement north, given the resentment it created among white workers. Oh, this is a great question, and I think this is something that scholars are always trying to find the way to articulate. Um, conditions in the South were abysmal because of Jim Crow repression. Um, sharecropping and the inability for African Americans to access the vote. In the North, things were slightly better because the wages were higher, but this labor tension that you talk about is very real. And one of the reasons why African American labor was recruited to the North is because African Americans were often used as strike breakers during the age of, you know, uh, trade unionism and all white unions. So there was a lot of resentment from white workers, but it didn't necessarily prevent black workers from actually working and earning wages. I think that the big um, kind of issue that really um, got in the way of African American um, you know, progress in the North was the problem of housing. Um, you know, housing was um, such a critical issue, and we just finished reading a book um, by Joe Allen called People Wasn't Made to Burn, and it was a, this tragic story of a house fire that killed several children, but these house fires were very common in the black slums in Chicago because the housing was so unsafe. And so here, you know, when you take some from column A and some from column B, you know, some people will say that the Great Migration was still kind of worth it because African-American quality of life kind of improved and there was an opportunity for African-Americans to actually participate in local and national elections as voters. And this becomes critically important when we see the mid-century civil rights struggle to get the vote for everybody. Mm, fantastic, thank you. 
Um, this question comes from uh, Ormond. Ormond's at the North Carolina School of Science and Math, located in Durham, North Carolina, uh, very near the uh, the center. Ormond's wondering, um, or he states and then wonders, uh, many people came to an awareness of the Great Migration through the warmth of other suns. Do you use this text in class? And if so, how do you integrate it into what you do when teaching about the Great Migration? You know, I have um, assigned it, and students read, you know, all 600 pages because um, the character development and storytelling is so rich. Um, I like to present different um, – I like to experiment with genre with students. So um, sometimes I'll have them read that book. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't assign it um, this year because I just wanted to do something a little differently. Um, the People Wasn't Made to Burn book is – a historically grounded um, nonfiction book like Warmth of Other Suns so that students can see that history is written a lot of different ways. Um, it's a beautiful book. I think that you can do some nice excerpting of it in order to, um, you know, introduce students to the experience of uh, migrating, the pull factors, the push factors, and some of the implications for the um, migration today. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. One last question and then we'll move on. Uh, this question comes from Annie in Richmond, Virginia. She's wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you use or um, interpret maps in your work. How do you use a, a geospatial perspective? Um, so one of the things that we do, and I think I might have a slide that shows it in a few clicks. I thought I had that slide, that's so strange. Um, oh, I do. So, you know, we use some of these um, maps to show the growth of um, residential segregation. So this is a map of Chicago's Black Belt, the names of the neighborhoods, and how that ring formed uh, to create some of the early um, slums and the highly segregated areas. Um, the redlining map is Redlining maps uh, that are available online are always really helpful for students to kind of understand some of the continuities of that. Um, the other thing that, um, um, you know, that could be really helpful is the, um, the Cooper Center for Public Service at um, the University of Virginia has that racial dot map. And the racial dot map is also really helpful because it's based on, it's actually a little outdated now because it's based on, based on the 2010 census, but it can get really, it can kind of like drill down to like highways and streets. And so um, I like to use the racial dot maps and some of the redlining maps to show students kind of the implications of some of the migration era residential segregation today. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Professor, My by far the worst part of my role here is being the timekeeper, so we have about a half an hour, 35 minutes or so mm -hmm. before we'll start to wrap up. So let's go ahead and move forward and I'll continue to collect questions. Absolutely. Um, so another kind of way that I sometimes like to shape uh, content on the Great Migration is to think about topics of inquiry and the types of assignments that you can kind of um, use using this this organization. And so sometimes I, um, you know, say today we're going to look at the work, and we look at um, some of the industries that people entered when they went to northern factories. Um, you know, whether it's Detroit and looking at the plight of black workers in the automotive industry, particularly at the Ford factory. Um, if you, um, you know, are, are teaching in the Northwest, you might want to talk about um, the shipbuilding or on the Northeast shipbuilding. You know, what are the different industries that are calling upon um, black workers? Um, Another thing that we like to think about in terms of topics of inquiry is the call. Um, what are the different ways that people are called north? What kind of stories are they reading in publications? What are some of the ways that migrants are writing about their experiences in the north? And what are would-be migrants you know, writing to outlets like the Chicago Defender? And I'll get to um, how to access that resource uh, shortly. 
Um, and then the reflections, you know, um, one of the things that I did in my book was I, um, I, I worked in the archive of some interviews that were done with E. Franklin Fraser, the sociologist, of girls talking about what they think of the North. And it's really varied. You know, some girls saying how much they miss the South. They don't understand the weather in Chicago. They don't understand elevated trains. It's too loud. You know, their parents have started drinking a lot and going out late at night. And so um, sometimes uh, we just work on, you know, what kind of work did people do? How were they called and moved to that work? And what are their um, reflections on it? And so if you don't have perhaps all the time in the world to go and be, uh, do a deep dive into the Great Migration, these kind of areas can help you, um, you know, kind of explore. And again, this is a great uh, opportunity to do local history. And if you are teaching in the South, you know, the Great Migration patterns for many families is they went to a larger um, metropolitan area in the South before they went North. So there is a great migration story uh, for Richmond and Birmingham and Atlanta and, you know, so it, there's a story, um, you know, um, in almost every part of the country that might resonate uh, really strongly with your students. And another kind of way that um, I've done this migration classes is a city study, an intensive city study. Uh, because of my expertise, I've picked Chicago before. So some of the things that I do with students is we look at population changes. Um, sometimes um, we'll talk about confrontation. We'll use that theme to talk about the race riots. Um, the report of the Commission on the Chicago Race Riots of 1919 has been digitized. And it is a really amazing document because a lot of the origins of the unrest in Chicago are illuminated. And again, these are topics that students, when they read, I think they're really surprised by how much they relate to some of the concerns that people had, whether it is um, the problem of police brutality, whether it's the problem of um, fights over public space, whether it's the problem of education or securing well-paying jobs, the Chicago Race Riot provides an opportunity to help students see the ways that people um, reflected on the experiences of coming north, why they found it disappointing, and what happens when the context that people migrate to isn't welcoming or ready for their presence. Um, we've also talked about this issue of housing and the growth of Chicago's Black Belt, and again, the racial dot maps, which um, will be updated on the, for the Cooper Center according to the audience chat, um, and others uh, provide an opportunity for students to see that continuity. And then going back to the Obamas, looking at the legacies of the Great Migration, whether it's through political um, action, whether it's through its music, art, we always find a way to kind of come back to what this city means today and our understanding of it. All right, um, I am going to just show you a few things that I like to use for uh, resources and then I will answer some more questions. Um, I try in my classes to try to do a research workshop with students to help them understand how people do research on the Great Migration. Um, since COVID, uh, closed school down like a year and a half ago, I have been doing assignments um, in which the students uh, only use online resources so that everyone has an opportunity um, to kind of do their best work. Um, so we talk a lot about black newspapers. Uh, the great documentary by Stan Stanley Nelson, uh, uh, Soldiers Without Swords, about the black press. Um, has excellent content about the importance of publications like the Chicago Defender in recruiting um, people to come to Chicago and other cities for work. Um, you know, sometimes we focus on the headlines, the types of stories that are being um, written about the experience. Um, sometimes I'll pick a few cartoons and the students can interpret the cartoons. And this is always a really great activity with students of all grade levels have them understand like what are the messages that are being uh, uh, communicated. When I want to teach about the complicated relationships between social class 
and migrant status, I showed them this cartoon. It was a series of the Defender called Bungleton Green, and it was a bunch of rules for newly arrived mi migrants to not stick out, to blend in. You know, there was a, a real sense on the part of the black middle class who had been in Illinois for a while and had been in Chicago for a while um, that they didn't want to be judged as similar to the new migrants. And so they would do this type of, you know, um, you know, they would kind of, what am I trying to say? They would try to do these kind of social norming um, campaigns around these cartoons. And so this um, helps students also think about ways that they learn social cues and social rules in new environments. Uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History um, published the Journal of Negro History for many years, which is now the Journal of African American Hist History. And one of the things that they did in um, 1919 is they published a series of letters of Negro migrants. And this is available online. Um, it's open, uh, even though it's on JSTOR. And you can read letters that migrants wrote um, about their experiences, letters in which they are seeking help from the Chicago Defender to try to get a train ticket and a job um, lead uh, to Chicago. And so this is always a great activity with students. Um, you can introduce your students to online archives. Um, so this is from the New York Public Library. They did a series called In Motion. Um, AME, and it's about the African American migrant experience. Um, and In Motion has all sorts of resources about several types of migration and immigration, and their content on the Great Migration is really fantastic. So I highly recommend checking out uh, the New York Public Library site. Um, you can introduce your students to public history um, by uh, going to the National Museum of African American History and Culture website through the Smithsonian Institution. And if you go to the section uh, called Explore, you can look at the searchable database of their collections. And if you enter Great Migration, you see publications, you see um, biographical sketches of people of uh, significance, you see items that they've collected in the museum. And one of the assignments that I like to give to students is to tell them if they are going to curate an exhibit for the museum on the Great Migration, what five objects would they include? And then what would they write um, about the significance of this item? So it's a really great creative project for students. And then the last thing is that no Great Migration course is complete, I think, without an exploration of the creative arts. And so one of the things that we've been doing um, in class um, was um, we look at the lyrics of different uh, Great Migration era um, artists. So this is a Bessie Smith song. Um, before you... Um, assign this type of music, please listen to it first, because some of the content <laughs> is not appropriate for kids. Um, and, you know, we analyze the lyrics. Uh, this one comes from, you know, one of these lyrics websites. And, you know, it's a great, um, again, opportunity for students to do some reflective work as well as some uh, creative research. So I'm going to go back to answering questions uh, for the remainder of our time. Um, Fantastic. Um, well, we do have questions that are queuing up. And so, again, I would encourage everyone in our audience to reflect on what's been shared tonight, drop a specific formal question in the Ask the Professor tab. That'll come to me. I'll bring it to Professor uh, Chatwin. Um, first question comes from Sonia. Sonia is associated with St. John's University. Um, she's wondering how instructors I'm sorry, I'm going to read this sort of out loud and to myself first. Uh, oh, Garner, I apologize. This is the problem, Marcia. I've got, my eyes are getting old, and I thought it said Gamer, and it says Garner. Yeah, the font is way too small on my, my laptop. I apologize. Here's the question. How can instructors garner student engagement in exploring archived media sources and connecting them to literature centered on the Great Migration? 
She's thinking specifically about an archived column from an African American newspaper and pairing it with oral testimony or an account oh, by a microphone. That's a great idea. Um, you know, um, you know, I think uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, the engaging the archived um, media sources, I think, I think students actually really like it. Um, one of the things that we did um, this semester is students had to come up with a playlist, not unlike the playlist that opened up the course. And so they, I think, feel very comfortable in exploring kind of what they can find online to uh, use as a snapshot of the period. Um, sometimes students will find YouTube clips or performances, um, you know, so I think that, you know, thinking about one of the themes, so one of the themes could be longing or homesickness and letting students, you know, kind of explore a digital archive and saying, I want you to connect two, th two things that talk about homesickness, be creative. I think that there gives them an opportunity to kind of do that kind of engagement where they can't fulfill um, the request by a simple Google search. They have to kind of engage with the text to, um, to determine if it really kind of fits the parameters. Awesome, thank you. This question comes from Sarah. Sarah's in Sonomish County, just north of Seattle on the West Coast. She's wondering when the term, the Great Migration was imagined and developed because certainly during the Great Migration, there was, you know, that term was not used. When, when did that term become uh, commonplace? It actually was used. Um, if oh. you look, if you look at, um, this is actually one of those weird moments that someone is labeling it. Um, so Robert Abbott, the editor of the Great Migration, he um, calls it the Great um, the Negro uh, the the Great Negro um, Migration um, North in an article as early as 1915. Oh, and wow. so even though it's not used all the time, but it's used in that context because he sees this as um, a great opportunity for him as a businessman. He left Mississippi and found his fortunes in Chicago, but one of the things he realizes is that um, the great northern migration is going to bring more black consumers to cities and he can sell more ads in his newspaper. So it's called the Great Northern Migration pretty early, um, and I think that um, you know it, it, it's a term that people um, will associate with this period of time that runs to 1970 um, in scholarly uh, explorations. You know, throughout the 40s and 50s, you actually see hear people or see people using it in text. Yeah, that's interesting, and I wonder if because it was named and because it was identified even as early as 1915 as as a thing, as a movement, did, did that in some ways inspire and attract and facilitate m more great great migrators? <laughs> in other words, was was the fact that yeah. it was a name was, was it visible, and so that that led to more participation? I think it made it more intriguing and more alluring, and it maybe mm -hmm. gave the sense that it was more like of a possibility, because this is an incredibly hard sell. <laughs> You're telling people to uproot themselves and completely take a chance on, you know, a place and space that is deeply unfamiliar. I think it's an indication of the desperation for change, but it's also an indication of the stories that are told about what happens when you participate in this thing. So I, I definitely think that there is a, um, there's a way that by calling it the Great Migration, and this is after a period of time that people were, you know, talking about the Great War, that it does add a little bit of more um, interest in, in the enterprise. Yeah, certainly. Um, this is a personal question, Professor. Um, you, you mentioned that you grew up in Chicago. Do you remember how you were taught the Great Migration uh, as a high school or a K-12 student? How, how did they handle it when you were a student? Yeah, you know, it's it's not it's something that I think was always in the backdrop. Um, one of the things I, I wrote in my most recent book was, you know, the first time I read a book about the Great Migration, it was a book called um, Up North. 
and it was an edited collection by Maleko Adero, and it was because I was in a quiz bowl competition, and the theme was the Great Migration. And so in many ways, I think the substance of learning about the Great Migration happened, unfortunately, outside of school because, you know, I went to high school in the late 1990s and electives in African American history or even like a real acknowledgement of the importance of African American history wasn't really part of my formal, my formal um, learning, um, but I do remember in AP English we read um, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and I think that really helped open my eyes to a certain um, experience that wasn't my family history, but, you know, was so important. Yeah, fantastic. That leads to uh, a, a second question, actually, by Sonia. She asks if there are works of literature by modern African-American writers that capture these complexities and dynamics that you might uh, recommend. Um, you know, I think, I think that it's interesting. Um, you know, Richard Wright's Native Son is considered you know, a, a classic example of a kind of great migration literature. Um, it's, you know, very violent and kind of disturbing. Um, but Richard Wright also did a long form nonfiction photo journalistic essay called 12 Million Black Voices that talks about the struggle in the South and the migration North that I think is really appropriate for students and has some really beautiful pictures from um, the Farm Services Administration that were taken during the, the Great Depression. So I'd recommend 12 Million Black Voices. Um, I would also recommend um, the Gloria Naylor book, The Women of Brewster Place, that really talks about kind of black women and the urban context. Um, another piece of literature that's really good is Anne Petrie's The Street, that talks about kind of this black woman's struggle to kind of make it in the city um, you know, there's there's also, I, I would say that uh, a lot of James Baldwin's text is coming off of a great migration moment, and he's trying to help people understand that they don't have to completely distance themselves from the South to kind of feel redeemed in their new experiences in the North. Um, so there's a lot of really great stuff. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Mike. Mike is at, uh, where are you, Mike? You're at um, Sewickley Academy in Pennsylvania. And Mike uh, wonders this. European immigration ebbed and flowed, and we have documented reasons why it stopped, such as civil war and world wars. Was there a similar event that caused the end, or at least the, um, the, the, the suspension of the Great Migration in 1970? Yeah, so, you know, people often say that this was the moment where um, the number of people um, leaving the South starts to taper off. I think part of it, there are a lot of, you know, explanations um, why, and then there's, you know, the reverse migration that starts in the 80s and late, the late 80s and the early 90s where more African Americans are returning to the South for economic opportunity. Um, I think part of it is, the recessions of the 1970s, um, are, there aren't as many opportunities in the North. I think that um, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 gives people greater hope um, that things can change in the South and then the election of black mayors in major cities and black uh, elected representatives gives people new investment in the South. I think that you know, starting in the 1970s, the federal government is starting to invest a little bit more in the South and trying to combat, um, you know, some of the poverty that persisted um, into the 1960s that had been eradicated in some parts of the North. And I also think that, you know, the explosiveness of um, the late 1960s summers and the economic um, hardships of African Americans in the North, uh, fewer people were willing to kind of take those risks to see if they could establish a better quality of life in Northern and Western cities. Great, thank you. So uh, our friend Carl is gonna really test your interdisciplinary chops. He's gonna expand on my question earlier just a little bit by asking if you have any recommendations for major Harlem Renaissance poets that have poems specifically to the migration. So this is an interesting one. Um, you know, the the Harlem Renaissance is such a, like, a, a blip 
in um, in the kind of radar um, because the depression kind of upends it. Those you know people make all sorts of arguments that there were multiple renaissances and that there was a Chicago one that was more sustainable. Um, I think that, let me think, um, I think Claude McKay's Home to Harlem might be one. Um, I think you can make a case that some of the work that's done by, um, oh, holy smokes, um, uh, that I think Gene Toomer's Cain which is this kind of experimental um, novel about leaving the South. It's from the 1920s, and it, he's part of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, you know, it's, it's part of that. Gene Toomer's cane is really unusual, and um, Gene Toomer himself um, kind of rejects black identity after writing this book that celebrates black identity. Is also kind of like a fascinating person. Um, I think that you could say, um, gosh, this is a really great question. Um, some of the work of Zora Neale Hurston, when she talks about the kind of the the joy of black Southern life is in some way resisting the assumptions of the Great Migration as the Northern context as being um, better. Um, and then James Walton Johnson, who is um, the writer that writes the lyrics for the Negro National Anthem, um, he has a book called The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man that is also about kind of reckoning with the South. I'd say off the top of your head, that's a pretty good list. Thank you. Thank oh. you for, uh, <laughs> for stretching that way. This question comes from Ormond. He gets a second question as well. He's wondering this. What value do you find when teaching the Great Migration and discussing the African American cultural institutions in the South and the many people who stayed behind in the South? In other words, how do you bring in the people who actually didn't leave? Yeah, I think that is so important. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, I try to emphasize to students. And I think that um, historians broadly are better at emphasizing that there are people who, um, you know, there are people who, who decide that there is something to be done in the South. And also one of the things that I'd like to point out to students is that there was an entire agreement that this was a good idea, that there were people who were anti-Northern migration from a lot of different perspectives. Um, some people were anti-Northern migration because they felt like African Americans were rooted in the South, that was their land, and that they should kind of wait to see if things get better. Um, some people thought that you stayed in the South because it was a simpler, kind of more pure way of life and that the North had a corrupting impact on people. Um, some people um, believed that staying in the South would allow for, um, you know, an opportunity to um, stay connected uh, to places that were familiar and that all of the promises of the North were empty and false. And so I think that one of the things that I try to show is that movements that we often associate with the urban context, for instance, like the Garvey movement, which had advocated a back to Africa project for African Americans, had Southern chapters. And the political radicalism of um, some of the African Americans who would participate in the mid-century civil rights movement in the 30s and 40s, who were members of the Socialist Party or the Communist Party or who were pro-labor, they had colleagues in the South that um, the North didn't necessarily mean that a person would adopt a set of political priorities just by virtue of being there, that these ideas were shared in the South as well and that they animated local activism um, that we see later in um, the 1950s. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, this question comes from Tisha, RTA. Tisha, again, is at New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, first of all, she wants to thank you for your presentation tonight, and here's her question. In the wonderful book, Southside Girls, and specifically in the chapter you provided, you discuss uh, the race representative campfire girls and young girls who are deemed delinquent for a variety of reasons. Could you talk a little bit more about the experience of children from the journey of their experiences in the North or West during the Great Migration? 
Yeah, you know, I think the idea that, you know, African-American children could actually have a childhood is part of the Great Migration experience because, um, you know, there was the possibility of creating um, greater leisure opportunities as well as um, African-American children going to school regularly, which were really two important features of um, migration, that school attendance uh, could be normalized because there wasn't a need to arrange a child's life around the agricultural schedule, although children still um, were laborers and, you know, still had to work. And then the other thing was, um, you know, the, the possibility that children could do things like be in scouting, that they could be in camping. And so the reason why I think that um, children are such an interesting kind of view into this migration experience is because they are subject to the agency of other people. Uh, they, do, they do not choose to migrate, but they have to grapple the consequences of migration. And one of the consequences of migration is that children are also subject to kind of more, um, uh, more opportunities for intervention into their family's life. And so, you know, you see juvenile courts, you see social workers, you see a whole body of people who are kind of getting involved in their life beyond their immediate family circle. And I think that's also interesting to think about the ways that children have to negotiate relationships, um, you know, with people who, who aren't their parents but have kind of authority over them. So I think that um, the other thing I would say about exploring this topic is that there's an incredible body of popular culture that's generated by children and their interests and the desire to sell things to children. And so the Great Migration is trying to sell a series of urban experiences and products to black consumers, but it's also setting up a Billiken Club, and it's also setting up all of these kind of um, the special edition of the Defender called you know, the Defender Junior, and there's the Brownies book, and there's all of these different publications um, for children. And so it's creating um, a literary culture and a commercial culture for black children that I think is, can be a really great um, place to explore. Yeah, thank you. And I'm curious, and this may, this may be a question that's a little too involved for the last few moments we have remaining. Um, when you think about families and now parents with children who are considering their next move, uh, what impact or what influence did education have on the choices of the destination, whether it was access to education or um, or, or other kinds of uh, legal and social kinds of barriers, how did, how did education inform the Great Migration? Um, you know, I think education and access education was probably more fantasy than reality. Um, a number of migrant families talked about the possibility that their children. Mm -hmm. Could go to call, um, go, could go to school regularly, but when their right. children arrived, they realized that they were really behind academically. There was also right. kind of, um, you know, a culture in which Southern children stuck out. Sometimes their teachers thought that they, you know, weren't as bright as their Northern peers, and so there was a lot of intra-racial conflict and a right. lot of class conflict and a lot of lack of preparedness that made education uh, sometimes a really disappointing possibility. And that's something I talk about um, in my book as well. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. Um, here's one last question. This one goes to Allie. Allie's a good friend at the Bank Street School in New York City. Um, again, this is a, this is a, a, a deep question, but uh, I, I suspect you can answer it in the time we have left. Um, did the Great Migration influence the emergence of the modern civil rights movement, and if so, how? I think absolutely. Um, by creating a cohort of um, Northern folks who had the experience of voting, I think was so important. The black vote, um, you know, allows for Harry Truman's election to the presidency. It is, it is, you know, wrangled and manipulated, but depended upon for the local politics in cities like, you know, Boston and New York and Chicago. Um, I think that the Northern experience of being voters uh, gave people a lot of sympathy and a lot of pause about the kind of voter repression that was happening in the South. I think that a lot of, um, you know, children of migrants who do get those first opportunities for educational and economic 
um, mobility, the students who become undergraduates at places like Howard University and Shaw University and, you know, um, uh, uh, Green, uh, at Greensboro, um, they uh, play a part as leadership in the civil rights movement as well. And so I think that the migration plants the seeds of proximity to the institutions that will be formative for the northern student movement uh, to go to the south and to also um, create a context in which there are a group of African Americans who are more respected, if not fully respected by the state, who are able to appeal to the state for their needs, participate as voters, that will really highlight the injustices in the south. Uh, Professor Mar uh, Marcia Chaitlin, thank you so much for your time tonight, for your insights and your stories. We really do appreciate you pulling together the readings and the PowerPoint and walking us through this, uh, this important topic. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, everyone. Best of luck. And I want to thank all of our participants tonight for joining tonight's webinar. I do hope that we see you in future National Humanities Center activities. Um, please follow our, on our websites as well as our Twitter feed, and you can get uh, announcements for upcoming events. Our next event happens to be just next week, October 21st. I'll be joined by Christopher Gonzalez from Utah State University. Our topic will be problems in Latinx representation and storytelling. I hope to see all of you there. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day at school tomorrow. We'll see you next time at the Humanities of Class webinar series. Good night.